G'day, I'm Dr Kev, and in this video we're going to have a look at design methodologies and how they apply to the design of a sports car. Welcome to Car Design Workshop. When undertaking a large engineering project like the design and manufacture of a sports car, there are a lot of decisions to make. There are fundamental decisions like what sort of motor you're going to run, uh, what sort of chassis are you going to use, and the tyres that you might use in the car. And these fundamental decisions are going to be very difficult to change once you've made them. Then there's intermediate decisions, and these are ones that are going to extend from the fundamental decision. So the tyre choice that you have is going to decide the wheel choice you might use. The chassis style that you're going to implement is going to dictate uh, how your bodywork might be uh, made and assembled. And then there's many minor decisions as well. And these might be, what sort of battery are you going to run? What's the fluid that you're going to put in your transmission system? And these decisions are quite easy to change. Some of these decisions are going to be difficult to make and are going to take a, a lot of research. And some of these are going to be so trivial that you wouldn't even be aware that you're making them in the process of design. And that's what design is. Design is a process of decision making. And when we make decisions, we start with a problem, we gather information, we carefully define that problem, we generate potential solutions, we evaluate those solutions, and then we decide on a way forward. And models of doing this design or design methodologies have been created that help make these processes more streamlined. Now in this design process, time really matters. We need to make sure that we're making good decisions in an appropriate time frame. As time goes on, decisions that you make earlier in the process become much more expensive to fix, including if you end up designing the entirely wrong thing and you have to redo it at the very end. When you're looking at creating a product that has uh, competition, then you also have the risk of your competitors beating you to market or not meeting a deadline. And one question with this is, that's such an important thing when you're designing your own car? And I think the answer is a clear yes. If you have a look through classified ads, you'll find many project cars that are up for sale. People take on projects, uh, maybe realize the project is far harder than they had first imagined, and then abandon those projects. Even though there aren't competitors for building your own car, there are competitors for your time. There's a lot that you can be doing with that, and a poorly planned, overly expensive project is going to be something that will be abandoned. Now, in order to make good decisions in a reasonable amount of time, engineers have developed a number of different design activity models. And the one that I keep coming back to is this one from Stuart Pugh. So this is a book uh, called Total Design, and it outlines a design activity model that covers everything from the initial market research around a project into the final delivery of a product. This model breaks the design activity down into six main stages. The first of these is the market, and this addresses user needs and demands. The second is specification or the product design specification. The third is conceptual design. The fourth is detailed design. The fifth is manufacture. And the sixth is selling or installation. And while these stages are listed sequentially, the process has inherent iteration to it. Issues that arise in later stages in the design process will require revisiting early stages, and some of the work will be conducted in parallel. So if we have a look at the first stage, this is our market research phase. And this isn't just looking at the person that's going to end up buying the product or using the product. This is a general information gathering part of the process. So in this, we would look at things like what are the registration requirements for a vehicle? Where can we source parts? What books or info do we need to read? We might compare products as well. 
and maybe we would compare projects. So we might say, well, how does this building your own car sit alongside other projects that might interest you, such as building a boat or building an instrument? And what we're trying to do in this stage is to find the main parameters and the important parameters that are going to influence the success of the project. And this is going to help define and guide your fundamental decisions. We're trying to determine the needs of the user. And in this case, the user might be you, or in my car, the user might be me. And is it possible to clearly state what we want from the vehicle and what we want from the project? Now, this is something I've mentioned in the first couple of videos of this channel, and they might be worth you having a revisit if you hadn't had a look at them. Now, the second stage is the product design specification. And this is where we start to put numbers and requirements on what were our user or market needs. What we would want is to completely specify the product. And this becomes really a, a document or a guide for all future decisions that we would make. We would check them against the product specification. To start with, we might have a really short list of specifications. We might want it to be fast and good looking and have lots of carbon fiber. But there's a lot more than that to think about. We want to think about what are the maintenance requirements? What are the manufacturing facilities we'll use? How are the ergonomics involved? What's the safety of the vehicle? And it can be good to start this fairly early, even while we're conducting market research, as it helps to determine what we're looking for. This is particularly useful when we want to create benchmarks using other products that we would compare our project with. Now the third phase, and I think one of the ones where we start to get pretty excited when we're doing the engineering is the conceptual design. In fact, this is a stage that we'll often rush to. We'll, we'll want to get into making the decisions before we do an appropriate amount of research, an appropriate amount of specification. This is an exciting part of the project. This is where we're generating solutions, where we're evaluating solutions. And both of these processes, the generation and the evaluation, are both really important. If we don't generate enough different solutions, there's a great possibility that we would miss opportunities and miss ideas that would be very valuable. If we are poor at evaluating our solutions, then there can be really big costs involved. And in practice, when we're designing, it's difficult to be objective. Engineers aren't robots. We uh, we have things that we really like, solutions that we really like. If you go into a design meeting, particularly in a team, you'll often go in defending your solution, even sometimes to the point where you know you are defending a less good solution. It's just one that you happen to like. But we do want some measure of objectivity here. So when we're generating our ideas, there's a number of different techniques that we can use. We can use things like uh, brainstorming, analogy, listing attributes, checklists, inversion, where we take an idea and turn it around, or a combination where we take two ideas and put them together and come up with something new. And as we mentioned before, we want this to be a fruitful process. We want to generate a lot of ideas. But it's very important that we then go through and select those ideas. And we want to avoid making these gut feeling decisions. We want to continually give opportunities for new concepts to emerge even after we've reduced the number of concepts. We want to look for ways to reverse the negatives of concepts and come up with solutions that would make those concepts viable again. And skipping this step and not doing this well is a real false economy of time. While we may have made the decision quickly, it'll almost certainly come back and bite us later in the project when that concept is either too hard to build or it doesn't quite meet the specifications that we were after. In order to evaluate our concepts, we're going to need a list of criteria. And this is going to be drawn from our product design specification. We're going to need an ability to estimate what are the importance of the various criteria and the degree to which a particular concept meets that criteria. We can use things like matrices for concept evaluation, and they can give structure and control to this decision-making process, but we need to approach these with a great deal of caution. When we're doing these sorts of uh, design matrices and these, and these evaluation methods, 
we end up choosing the weightings. And it's really common in an engineering setting, in a design setting, to end up choosing the weightings to choose your favoured solution rather than bringing in that objectivity. And this is where doing this selection process inside a, a group is particularly helpful. So one person might uh, highly rank one particular criteria and another might think that, uh, an, that a second criteria is far more important. And the discussion of that group and, and bashing through those ideas is a fruitful way to end up selecting the right solution. And that's going to be a little bit difficult when I'm taking the lion's share of the design of this car, but will be depending upon the feedback from a lot of people that have already commented on the videos that I've made. Now the fourth stage listed is the detailed design. And if you're a real detail oriented engineer, this is where you wanna start. You just jump in, uh, get involved with doing some CAD work, doing some FEA and doing some simulation work. And this part of the design process is going to take a lot of time. We need to do calculations. We need to do simulations. We need to create construction drawings, CAD drawings, uh, a lot of work in here. We might be doing uh, CFD to have a look at airflow over the car, finite element analysis to determine how, uh, how structurally sound components are. And this is why it's so important that we get the earlier stages of the project right. Otherwise, we're going to be spending a lot of time doing detailed design on concepts that either aren't going to work or are not going to be ideal. The reality of this channel is we're going to spend a lot of time in the weeds of the detailed design. And I'm sure when people have a look at a channel about designing cars, this is the things they want to think about. How do we do the CFD analysis of a vehicle? How do we do the structural analysis? And this is also an area where the skills of design are going to be most tested. So there are parts of this that I've got a reasonable amount of experience with. There's parts of this that I'm going to have to learn. And there's parts of this I'm going to have to go to other engineers that I know and ask for a lot of advice and maybe even work through some of these problems. Now, the fifth part of this model is manufacturing. And if you're a fabricator and into making things, this is the part where you want to start. This is the part where things become real. Parts are being made, finished and assembled. And we want to consider manufacturing all the way through the earlier stages of the project. We want to think about it in our specification when we think of the resources that we have in order to manufacture this vehicle. And we want to think about it in our conceptual and detailed design and really consider that design for manufacture. The main aims when we're designing for manufacture is to minimize the component and assembly costs. And we want to minimize the development cycle and time. We want to make sure that higher products and higher quality products can be made. And when we're working in this manufacturing, there's going to be parts where we're going to have to design the process as well as the parts. Now, a car has many systems and those systems are going to use all sorts of manufacturing methods. There's going to be fabrication, machining, composite work, uh, you know, leather work in the interior. There's going to be all sorts of assembly processes. There's a lot of tools and techniques that are required in building a car. It's fair to say that this is going to be a part of the project where it'll be absolutely necessary to outsource some of the work. So I'm really hoping that the machinists and fabricators I know uh, won't uh, dislike me too much if I end up knocking on their door. Now, the last part of the total design methodology is selling. And this shows that an engineering project is not complete until it's in the hands of the client and being used. The end client for a car that you build is likely to be you alone. And that's where we need to think, what state do we need this project in in order for it to be considered done? Now, I'm a fan of Superfast Matt and his channel and the work that he does there. And I really like his good enough. And the reality is with all engineering projects, they end when they're good enough. Although I'm probably less likely to involve ham sandwiches in my work. 
Now, I don't think this project is going to be finished once it's registered and I'm driving around in the vehicle. In fact, I think there's going to be a bunch of development that occurs after the vehicle is registered. Getting a car to handle particularly well is not a process that happens straight after the thing is made. There is going to be testing and development, maybe some track testing. There's also the possibility that I might actually want to put this car on the track for some friendly competition. That won't be the ideal goal of the car, but I would like to see what it's going to be capable of in the end. I will be incredibly surprised if I'm going to be able to resist the temptation of bolting on a, a stickier set of tyres, maybe upping the power a little bit and seeing what sort of lap times I can put around Wanneroo. Now that covers the main steps of these design activity model and we're going to unpack these in a bit more detail and actually progress through the design in, in future videos. But it all sounds a little bit uh, robotic, a little bit scientific. But nothing could be further from the truth. Engineering is not science. We, we use science and we use maths to solve problems, but there is an element of subjectivity and difference between the products that we design. And cars are a great example of this. Cars cross over from being just a pure A to B transportation method into being art at times. And we see this with the thousands of different models that are available to buy new today, as well as all of the previous cars that have been made. If we focus on sports cars, we would say the goal of a sports car is to create an engaging drive, something exciting as discussed in the previous video. But there are many solutions to this. Some of these cars, even though they're very different, we can say are objectively good. We can, we can look at one car and say, that is a good car. We can look at another car and say, that is a good car, even though they're quite different. They have different engines, different tires, different uh, specifications. There are cars that we can say are objectively bad and did not work, did, meet, did not meet their design intent. And yet there is a sense of subjectivity around this. So there's cars that you will like and cars that you don't like. It's actually one of the great things about designing and building objects and products is it isn't just a science, it isn't just mathematics, it's not working through a set specification and coming up with one obvious answer. It's really exciting in engineering that you can have one problem and multiple solutions. And as we keep feeding information in and learning new things, the quality and performance of our solutions improve. Now, I've only very briefly gone through some of the ideas outlined in this uh, process, Total Design. I'd highly recommend this book if you can uh, pick it up secondhand. I'm not entirely sure that it's still in print. If it is, it's a good thing. Uh, it would really make you think about design processes. And while it's not the only design activity model out there, I can guarantee it's definitely worth the read. So thanks for your time.